What is going on, everybody? Welcome to episode number 69 of Betting and Boozing here on the HHH Racing Podcast. I am your host, Kyle Roscoe, and what a great, great show we have for you guys tonight as we are covering the Florida Derby card, one of the best cards I've seen in a very long time from top to bottom as Emma brings me in my beautiful... <laughs> My beers were back, ready to go. Thank you guys so much. Thanks. I appreciate it. Love you. As we cover uh, the race six and seven is the two graded stakes before the late pick five and the full all stakes late pick five on Saturday at Goldstream Park. It's going to be a fantastic show. If you guys are here, please go down below the video player and smash that like button and hit that subscribe button as well. It is the easiest way to help us out, and it really helps out the channel. It's completely free to you, but it lets us know that you guys are enjoying the content. And we'll continue to push out this video and other podcasts to the YouTube masses to hopefully bring people to the HHH Racing Podcast. Thank you very much. We greatly appreciate it. But guys, let's go through the peripherals real quick and let's get right into this card. Because like I said, there's a lot of good races on this card. Two big things that I want to touch on right now. Um, this Saturday um, is with Howard and Davey Lane. They're covering the last three races of the Dubai World Cup card, of course, including the Dubai World Cup. Davey Lane, if you guys are fans of the podcast, you guys know who he is. For those of you that are new, he's a fantastic uh, handicapper slash punter from the United Kingdom. Just an all-around great guy, and he knows, he knows his stuff, especially when it comes to those Euros shipping over to these big races. You're not going to want to miss it if you're playing the Dubai World Cup card in the morning on um on Saturday, and I'll get you that time. I actually don't know it off the top of my head, which I apologize, but I'll grab a few guys right now. But also this Sunday, guys, or this Saturday, or next Saturday, excuse me. Um, Hawth Hawthorne is inviting the HHH Racing Podcast and, of course, great friend of the podcast, Matt Miller, out to another pool party. It's next Saturday. That will be April 9th, or sorry, uh, April 6th, excuse me, April 6th. That Hawthorne is inviting us out from 3 p.m. Central to 5 p.m. Central out to Club Hawthorne in Villa Park. The OTB out there. Come have some fun, guys. It's a fantastic. I believe it is $35 to come to join in. But that so what that is, is they give us a thousand dollars to bet. And I'm bringing it up right now. As you can see it there, they give us a thousand dollar betting pool to play with and whatever we profit we share with the entire uh everyone that signs up so it's basically you know they call it a pool party so there's a thousand dollar pool whatever we bring that pool up to you guys get a slice of the profit and not to mention you guys will get drinks um food all of the above included with that 35 five dollar ticket so please come out 3 p.m to 5 p.m in villa park i will be there howard will be there matt miller will be there it's going to be a fantastic time get to meet us well, obviously, we're gonna um, gonna talk through all these races on Bluegrass Day, so you get to come out and hang with the to watch Sierra Leone race, which of course is going to be a fantastic time. So again, this Saturday at um, at Club Hawthorne OTB in Villa Park, Wood Memorial Day, Bluegrass Day, Santa Anita Derby. It's going to be an absolutely fantastic time. Plus. You might get a few of that profits. The first year we did this, we sent everyone home with over $150 extra than what they came with in their pockets. So we've done it before and we plan to do it again. Come out and join us at Club Hawthorne in Villa Park. Thanks again, Hawthorne. Greatly appreciate you bringing us out again. But again, to bring up the purposes here, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube, or Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Anchor, excuse me, is where you can find Every single episode posted of the HHH Racing Podcast channel in audio form. So please go rate, review, and subscribe over there. The Power Picks guy is still going super, super strong. Link is down below. It's also on the screen, patreon.com slash HHH Racing Podcast. Please go sign up to our affordable and profitable tip sheet. Over two and a half years, still well in the profit. Almost getting up over 550 picks by now. And it's only $4 a weekend. Two tracks, price plays. Uh, ABC grids for pick fives, just everything you need to be successful on a, on a, any given weekend. We give it to you for only $4 a weekend, which is much less than a lot of other people are charging. Please go to patreon.com slash HHH racing podcast to get those. And if you want any, if you want to see previous editions of the power picks or learn anything about us, please go to HHH racing 
gmail.com. But guys, like I said, we're going to took a little bit longer, but we have to get through all the good peripherals and especially with um, all the exciting things coming up for us. It's going to be a fantastic next few weeks of not only with the racing, but with all the stuff we have going on. And again, for any for last minute things, anything, follow me on Twitter at AP Roscoe K. But let's get right into today's Florida Derby cards. We're going to cover, like I said, races six, seven, very quickly. They're outside the pick five, but they are graded. So I wanted to talk about them. Then we'll get into the deep dive handicapping in the late pick five. And we have a little bit of a special guest coming for you guys. Um, you guys might know him if you're fans of the podcast, but we needed someone to bring the wisdom around here, you know, to keep all the young guys in check for um, for, for such a big card in the Florida Derby. So I'm going to bring him on first, and then we'll bring on all the rest of the of the idiots afterwards. But from Picks and Ponies, you guys would know him as this is not the early bird special, unfortunately, but the man is here. Paul Hallen from the Saratoga spe Special, Patrick Kunsel, Noah Maher, Charlie Freeman. Of course, all the boys are here. What's going on, everybody? Paul, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, thank you for having me. I, uh, Howard traded me. I feel like uh, just another pawn. He traded me for a uh, a bagel to be named later, I think, a bagel and cream cheese. But uh, <laughs> I'm with the young guys. I, I like being with the young guys. I bring the average age of the show up precipitously. You'll like this, Kyle. I just got off the phone with a good friend, Kelly Dorman. I said, well, I'm going on to chaperone tonight. And he said, yeah, they may end up chaperoning you. I said, well, that's <laughs> happened before. <laughs> uh, that's a, that might be a, uh, a shadow of Keeneland if, if if everything goes well like it did last year, Paul. It might have well, to chaperone but, you that yeah. night again. We'll see about that. Back to back, of course, I can't wait for Keeneland, game. regardless of how it goes. I can't nope. wait to get there. I mean, no kidding. And again, thank you for what you, all you've done. Looking forward to see the Dormans as well out that Friday night. It's going to be a fantastic time with the man all the way on the on the right there, Patrick Kunsel, who's going to show his face around Keeneland for the first time, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Right, Pat? <laughs> yeah, excited. I can't wait to see everything, especially Saturday morning. I get off and that's going to be a blast. So happy Paul could set that up. Yeah, and like I said, we got we're as I tell uh, as I tell Howard, we're in the biz, man. We got connections all around now, being from you know that he works. But I was gonna say, Paul, um, Howard wasn't gonna give you a day off. You just can't since you're not gonna be on the show tomorrow. You can't can't not be on a show in a week. So yeah, the Carolina. And and for the, for my for my uh, reward, I get to do the picks for you guys tonight in the Oak Lawn. For Saturday, yeah. so and you get double. On the <laughs> I'm going. <laughs> no, you know where I'm going tomorrow, Noah. Where Coach Cal doesn't go anymore. The Sweet Sixteen. <laughs> there we go. That's what I love. That's, to a, hear. that's a good one. That's a good one. And you got a late night ahead of you, Paul. That's a late. I heard the, the oh, second Pat, don't, oh, You know what? I just taped my rant of the week, Patrick. I wish you said that a half hour ago. That how about the L.A. region? Yeah. The games are starting earlier Eastern time than the Boston region. So this tip-off tomorrow night scheduled for game two is 10.09, okay? I'm looking for a binky. And and it gets worse. <laughs> UConn, San Diego State, maybe could be a blowout, right? You know, I mean, UConn's yeah. really good. Well, why can't that be the second game? They, are, they go up 16 at the half, and Paul goes home and has his binky. No. We got Iowa State, Illinois, which is probably going to be like a double overtime game. Yeah, in right. Second. Yeah, no, anyway, yeah, of course. Good to no, go. That's, though. It's, it's good to be there. That, of course, but man, yeah, that's that's nuts. That fact that the Eastern games are are later than the games on the West Coast. Which well, it's not nuts for you four. It's nuts for old bastards like me. Well, I mean, yeah, I, 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 I would include I would include Kyle and Pat if we're talking about old fellas with a belly. <laughs> oh, jolly, bang! Yeah, I have a nickname, but I don't schedule. know if it's public. I have a yeah. nickname, I don't know if it's public. Yeah, so I, I'm included in that. Don't worry, Paul. <laughs> yeah, because Charlie's so much younger than all than me and you, Pat. He's well, I'm just saying, just... no, and I have the college advantage. We're on regular nights. We're up till two, three a.m. Still, anyway, you guys are past those days, though. Yeah, I'm past. Yeah. Trust me, my 8 a.m.s. I wish I had those back at this point. Um, getting up at six in the morning, one way or another, boys. Let's get it going here. Katie, of course, is here. Mark is here. Eric Anderson is here. Right at the wire. <laughs> I'm I'm doing good, man. Thanks so much for doing the show. 
Greatly appreciate it. The EdTech Workshop. I don't think I've seen this name before. Cheers to you, my friend. Hello from Fargo, North Dakota. That's the second North Dakota, man, as there's the other one. All aboard, my friends. Paul Conlin's here. Thanks so much, guys, for joining the show. Sylvain, do you know where you could find fine PPs in Dubai? I believe Brisnet has them, Paul, if I'm not mistaken. I don't think they're uh, – they might not be up yet. I'm going to look oh, right not? now. Yeah, so Paul will get uh, back to you on that, Sylvain. Thanks so much for joining the show, man. I'm checking Steve, right now. Steven Grutner is here. Hope the HHH gang crushes the pool party. Appreciate it. Howard brings in 1045 Eastern is when that Dubai World Cup will be starting on our podcast. All group ones, the last three races. Thanks, Howard. Thanks so much, man, for joining the show. Greatly appreciate it. Colin Quinn is here. Give us a little preview of later. Trust me. We'll see if anyone's sleeping on that. Colin, thanks so much for joining the show. Sean Kane is here. That's a great reason to miss the pool party, my man. Uh, good luck at the bluegrass and you know we'll see you down the road i'm sure but either way tom espinoza mike saletta another newer name that i don't think i've seen but cheers to you my friend thanks so much for joining the show really appreciate who else is here tom espinoza chris mack and um everyone else uh, if you guys are here please comment in the live chat of course we bring up everyone we read every single one and of course we'll try and bring you up on the screen but guys let's get right into it here is we're going to cover the first two greatest stakes on the card a little bit quicker kind of just go around on a round table and see what everyone thinks about these two races because even though they're undercard stakes guys these are and they're a little bit smaller fields they're both eight horse fields they're still pretty competitive there's a lot of horses that are around the same odds of favoritism starting with race number six and we won't necessarily show pps but i do want to show the equi base to kind of give you guys a sense of the fields. Paul, I'll start with you and just kind of go quickly through your uh, your top pick and maybe anyone you want to throw in underneath for race six. It's the Pan American Stakes, guys. Field of eight. And the morning line favorite is number six, Tawny Port, coming off a big race. Irad jumps aboard, giving you that Irad tax a nine to five. And a, a pretty good looking shipper, the number two, Cortez, for shipping over for Clement. Rosario gets them out, and the third choice is starting over for Mike Maker. And Paul, go ahead, give us your. Um, <clears throat> your kind of synopsis on the race as you have the number eight starting over on top. Yeah, I went back and watched that last race, the Mac Diameter, I believe mm -hmm. it's pronounced. And, uh, you know, you watch it, and and the four goes really uh, – starting over was the four uh, really wide on the on the far turn, loses a ton of ground, and you're like, this, this horse is not going to get up. And then probably the last 100 yards or so, just put on a huge kick and uh you know between that and the company uh he's kept uh, I, i'm gonna come right back with him I mean, i'm no genius five to two i didn't have the morning lines but I, I i think this is kind of a formful race uh if i were playing melties i'd be limiting it to the eight and six i thought tawny pot did run very well last time has really transitioned to turf well since he went over from brad cox to clement uh Five, three out of five on the board, a win in two seconds. Very honest race last time and really looked like a winner coming down to the wire and then uh, starting over just came over the top. So uh, nothing clever for me in this race. I'm going with the top two choices. Yeah, and um, no, I'll kind of shift it to you because I, I actually didn't get your picks for these uh, two under races. If you can just send them either in the chat or just tell me right now and I'll throw Yeah, them. I can tell you. I was 6-2-8. Uh, uh, in this race, um, so, a little bit. Different I, I agree two. with. Yeah, it's a little different, but pretty much kind of the the same as uh, what you guys are kind of thinking in here. I think starting over and and uh, Tony Porter very logical. I'm interested to see how this Euro does coming over. Um, I actually watched that last race. I think I think this Euro is going to be a little more forward than we're kind of used to seeing. So in a race that doesn't necessarily have a, a lot of pace on it, if Joel can kind of get this horse into a good position, uh, I think he's he's got a legitimate shot. Yeah, Charlie, I don't know if you thought it as well. Um, both these Euros, we'll get into the other one later in the Orchid, or as Noah would refer to it, I was going to leave that joke for later, but the Orchid, yeah, he, for those of you that have watched the show for a while. You ruined it. I know, I did ruin it. I should have just left it. But um, <laughs> both these Euros seem pretty tactical. And obviously... The, for the speed over in Europe can be completely different than the speed over in America. America tending to be a little bit faster up front, but both these zeros seem to be tactical, and that's got to help them, I would think. 
Yeah, I mean, for me, I didn't want all three to be chalk in my top three, so I decided to throw in Harry Hood, who seems to like running at Gulfstream in these long distance races. Is just you know twenty to one to throw underneath because why not? Yeah. Uh, yeah, for me, I kind of agree. I think Paul hit it on the head. It's between eight and six. I know that was a fun day for me to watch because I know you liked Tawny Point in that day who I had underneath. And my, one of my price plays that I gave out on our show was starting over who was like 10 or 11 to one and ended up getting the job done. As Paul touched, I was very impressed with that horse. I remember we were actually like watching all fair all together on StreamYard. Yeah. And, and Paul, again, like basically took the point that I was going to say that if you kind of, you know, watched off that turn, didn't really look like the horse had much of a chance, but I, you know, I like that starting over continued to look like a horse that was improving. And despite, you know, not getting the best, you know, move off the turn and having a decent amount of ground to make up just came flying late. And I think with a little cleaner of a trip and this horse, again, just sitting off the pace, the horse, to me, you obviously look from a figure perspective as well. The two best figures are both this track and, you know, going around these longer distances. So I really think starting over could be dangerous, but I mean, Tawny Point, has really enjoyed the switch over and was right there last time out. So I could easily see this horse win. I definitely think you'll get a better price on the eight because the IRAD tax. But uh, for me, I think it's between those two. Yeah. And obviously it, I agree with you guys as we all pretty much have it. It's, it's pretty close to a three horse race here. Um, the Euro is the one that throws the wretch in the mix. And I would like to see him sit kind of mid pack and maybe get the jump on horses like starting over. But Tawny Port will of course be forwardly place and can improve off that last race i'm going two six eight paul's going eight six two charlie's going eight six one and noah's going six two eight guys again real quick the other graded stake on the undercard is the ghost zapper going a mile and a 16th and the morning line favorite actually surprised me a little bit not really because i mean he did beat him last time but the number six steel sunshine ends up your nine to five favorite tumbarumba not to be too left far behind at two to one and your third choice is the number three, Il Miracolo, for John Velasquez and Antonio Sano. And um, no, I'll have to get your picks again here. But um, Paul, I'll just start with is this like a quiz? Do are we yeah. supposed to guess the, their picks, Kyle? Is this a quiz? Pretty much, I have pop quiz. What? Well, well, this wait. is missing homework assignments. Yeah, that's <laughs> also true. But no, we um, Christ, you and do you do that with Uncle Howard? You get detention. <laughs> yeah, that's hey, I. You know, that's the difference, I guess, between a school teacher and not a school teacher. But either way, Paul, you're going with Tumbarumba. Did lose last time, but um, <laughs> looks to get, I think, has a formidable trip here in this spot. Yeah, and I have not been a big Tumbarumba fan. I've actually been against Tumbarumba the last two times. It didn't work out that well. I thought that he did all the running in that race last time. Yeah. I mean, still Sunshine did come and get him fair and square, but – Boy, he was sitting on top a, a 45 and four half, uh, ran every step of the way and just got nailed at the wire. I have to come back with a horse like that uh, over the, even though the other horse beat him last time. Uh, you know, you 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 lose uh, Louis Saez, but you get Jose Ortiz. Uh, I, I just thought that that was a really good effort, and and this horse is really in form. Uh, in form. You have to go back to last July to come up with a clunker on this horse and uh, only had a few months off in the fall and came right back running. So I'm going to come right back with this horse off the last effort. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Obviously I have the five on top as well. Last time I completely agree with you. I think he did all, all the running steel sunshine just was able to get the trip coming on the outside. Charlie, you're going, um, you're going with steel sunshine. Anything you want to touch on that Paul didn't kind of prove your point of why Tumbarumba will get beat. No, I mean, I think, again, kind of like how the last race we thought it was between six and eight, I really do think this comes down. I think that was a formidable race, and I think it does kind of come down to uh, Steel Sunshine and Timberumba. Honestly, for me, I just think there is enough speed that it could be a decent enough contested pace. I mean, Omar Rocklow before Lee Place, uh, the horse we haven't really even touched on that I'm sure will take money because of I Adam Pletcher, Donegal Forever is going to be certainly, you know, taking money and is going to be forwardly placed. I'm sure X, Y point is going to have to go as well. So I just think there's enough pace that, I mean, if the five is able to sit just off and go right by, I think it'll work out perfectly. I can absolutely see that trip happening, but if it kind of gets too contested, I just think steel sunshine could take advantage. Plus I always just have to have a grudge against the five. I mean, everybody here knows why I can't, you know, entirely like the five from what that horse did to me in the past. But, uh, and then I will say the only other one I think is kind of interesting that nobody really touched on yet is lure him in is just a horse that, uh, you know, in these last two races has really improved. 
and uh, has run against some solid horses and has taken steps forward from the ability in the past where, you know, this horse was in that O'Connor Grand Aspen race and didn't really do any running, admittedly was dead on the board, uh, and then upset Octane, and then after that ran a very solid second, beating instant coffee and finishing my black belt. So if you are looking for more of a price, I think the one also could take advantage and sit a nice saving trip. I mean, definitely sets the um, the four to form, I guess you could say, is Paul's favorite horse, O'Connor, running in the running <laughs> lines. But – uh, Pat, I'll show you. I'll have you let you have last laugh here. Uh, you have number eight, Donegal Forever, on top, who's a very lightly raced horse for Todd Pletcher, and we've seen it once before, and, and it wouldn't surprise me to see it again. Yeah, I think this horse could improve even more. I mean, I know we could bring up, you know, pace. This horse might need the lead or be forwardly placed, but you know, I, I think you know, wins uh, his four year old, you know, debut off a layoff in the slop, you know, could have benefited from that, sure. Uh, but, you know, on debut, had an excuse. That was a really bad stumble. I remember watching that at Belmont. And I, I think this horse, like I said, could improve a lot tremendously. And for conditions <coughs> that, you know, are pretty high up there. And I think we know who this ownership group had, uh, Mo Donegal, right? I don't yeah, I was, that, well, that would be. Considering the, uh, the famed Donegal racing, you know, likes to include Donegal. If you see Donegal, you can take a I, I would be willing to take a bet. On who yeah. that ownership is, Jerry Crawford, not- Jerry Crawford, and Chris. Yep, correct. And I mean, look, it's this is a horse that we've seen it all the time with these connections like Pletcher, these lightly raced horses. They're coming out of optional claimers somewhere else, or this is actually at Goldstream off of a long layoff. Ended up getting the job done, and now Pletcher throws him into the into the ghost zapper. I mean, that's intent if I've ever seen it. Whether he can run or not in a race like this is obviously to be shown, but a 90 a 90 buyer winning the maiden i mean that's not that far off than a lot of these horses i think um the five and the six on numbers are obviously way ahead but there's no saying you can't improve off of like an 85 into like a low 90s this time and that could be easily be good enough to get in the money here so donegal forever is definitely not too far out of it by any means but guys let's move on to the late pick five here i will um so we'll go through. I'm going five one six. Paul's going five three six. Patrick's going eight six one. Charlie's going six five one, and Noah's going six three one. Guys, before we move into the pick five, I want to check real quick with the chat real right here. As let's see, Chris Couples is in the chat. Thanks so much, man, for joining the show. Somehow I missed meeting Kyle at the craps table or in Vegas. Must have been at the craps table. You know, that's not a fair. That's not a bad. Uh, not a bad guess, Chris. We definitely frequent in there a long while. But, Chris, thanks so much, man, for joining the show. Greatly appreciate it. I'm sure I'll see you sometime down the line. Mike Sledis says, cheers. I watch BNB the next day usually. Glad I finally made it to a live show. Thanks so much, Mike. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, you finally catching a live show because it's awesome to have you guys in the chat. Tanner Hawkins, what's up, my man? Thanks so much for joining the show. And I did see the poll in the chat. Howard put up a poll Um well, do you take fierceness? A little bit of foreshadowing. Do you take fierceness or the field in the Florida Derby? 66% of you, 20 of you out of the 30 votes went with the rest of the field. So a mm-hmm. little bit of foreshadowing is we'll get to our opinions later in the Florida Derby, of course. But there's definitely there's definitely a few uh, co-hosts on here that would agree with that statement. But before, cheers to everyone out there. Let's get into this late pick five, starting with the grade three Orchid stakes as that was gotta be, i have to do it man it's just got to be a punchline at this point but it draws it drew a field of eight now down to a field of seven with the number three r kelly kim being scratched out immediately is that um gives noah Ooh, and i didn't that's know based. that breaking and, news where's where's she going she going somewhere else um i'm not sure it just it literally she's gone on the drf form like it just goes from Whoa. two to four yeah, and she's mm. early scratch, so I'm not sure what's going on with her. Obviously, we'll have to keep our eyes out for where she ends up next. But a very early scratch for our Kelly Kim, who was shaping up to be a major player in here. And I'll kind of just give get updates as we go through with the picks, guys. But now a field of seven. <laughs> Your morning line favorite is number six, McCulloch for Irad and Bre- and Chad. Second choice is actually the Euro coming over La Mahana. For Joel Rosario and Clement, and your third choice, uh, not surprisingly, is surprisingly for Jose Ortiz and Todd Pletcher at five to two. And guys, we'll bring up the picks right now. Of course, we're gonna have to change them as some people did not know. Number three, R. Kelly Kim 
is and Paul, I'll let I we're treating you like a guest, but on this show, you are a guest, so of course, you're going to be going first. But uh, so you have the number six, McCulloch, the morning life favorite on top. Um, look, she's very formidable. Obviously, you can say all you want about the Breeders' Cup races and coming back, obviously, they will be bet. But she she was in the best form of her life nearing the four end of her four year old year, and Chad brings her in a pretty good, uh, a pretty good spot to be coming back. Yeah, and you know, not only was that race loaded, you know, in Spurro, warm, hot, yeah. Moira, um, you know, had the 10 post, uh, which is no no bargain. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm a sucker for this horse. I think you all know the story. Mary McCulloch was Chad Brown's first employee when he went out on his own. She was his bookkeeper for many, many years, passed away, and he waited to said he was going to name a, a, a real good horse for her, waited, landed on this one. and But th- this horse has really been ultra consistent throughout her career. And, you know, nothing uh, – important to me is she did win on debut if you go all the way to the bottom, Kyle. Mm-hmm. So that – that takes the layoff out of play. Although with Mr. Brown training, to me, the layoff is less than zero factor. Um, But, you know, nothing, um, you know, nothing but G's uh, on the board, you know, all graded stakes, as you said, uh, really was in great form going into that Breeders' Cup race. I'm not going to hold that race against her. You know, she's 22 to one. That'll show you the caliber of the field. Um, You know, Chad's good off, off this layoff and just on any layoff. I mean, you know, if you look at a beater, she did, she does max out at 94 twice. And, you know, there's other horses in here who look like if they advance, you know, surprisingly ran a 97 last time. There's a few, we don't know what this Euro is going to do. You know, my play in the race is going to be try to beat this Euro from the one, because I don't think he can have both of them value wise. So in trying to pick one of those two, uh, I'm going to go with Team Chad. I'm a sucker for the story. I'm always rooting for the story because of what I do. And uh, I think this, I've seen this horse run at Saratoga a few times. I think this horse is really good. She is. I completely agree with you. She's very good. And there's, and a lot of us agree with you. I have her on top. Actually, no, only two of us have her on top. Patrick went with the Euro, but we all have her in the mix somewhere. Charlie, I'll go to you next. A horse we need to talk about is surprisingly also or coming off of the Pegasus World Cup, excuse me, where she ran a great second to Didia that day at a bigger number. Another race that had just, you know, a ton of talent in it. Um, very formidable. Of course, Didia came, comes out with the win, but surprisingly not that far back and now comes back in this race where she could be just as good. Yeah, I just think it's interesting. I mean, this horse, and I apologize in advance for it sounding like a pun, but surprised, obviously, at 26-1 to to get within a neck and nearly win against a very, very talented field in a very formidable race where a lot of these horses have just been ultra-talented. Obviously, the stretch out is going to be the question, but I'm not really concerned. I think that, surprisingly, is a horse that is continuing to improve, which is obviously nice to see for a horse that's five. You know, you don't always know what they're going to be doing when you get to that age but i also just i trust pletcher i know obviously because it's pletcher and rapoli and it's not i read but it's still one of the ortizes this horse is probably going to take good money uh and it was kind of surprising honestly last time and i get that based off the you know past performances and how strong the race is that this horse wouldn't have been anywhere near favoritism but still 26 to 1 so to see the horse you know over on those odds and kind of fit the stereotypes that these pletcher rapoli horses always take money because they usually perform I just, I don't know. I thought this horse was very interesting and kind of a wild card. I wanted a fresh face and a horse that, you know, hasn't really had the chance to try this distance because the only one who really impressed me at these distances consistently was our Cali Kim, but then I saw the horse scratched. Um, I just tossed the Euro again, kind of like what Paul was saying. I feel like you can't have four, six, and one. You kind of need to try to pick one or two of them to roll with if you're going to play this race, you know, in a horizontal or anything. So uh, I won't touch on the six anymore because I think Paul kind of nailed it. But with the eight, you know, this was a horse that interested me last time as well. Uh, obviously, R. Kelly Kim ended up getting the job done, but I had touched on this horse before in the, when we covered uh, that race for a potential underneath finish, which obviously came through at nine to one is, you know, decent. I think I think Anatolian can do that again. I think this horse, unfortunately, kind of in the big races doesn't win, but, you know, has shown both times can finish in the money. So I think the eight could certainly do that again. And I think if you feel strong of any of the one, four, or six, you feel really strong about one of them to win. This could be a great horse to play in an exact underneath. Yeah, I mean, you know, they're going to be all around the same. Like the morning lines have them all pretty much around the same favoritism, anywhere between eight to five and five to two. 
obviously depending on how much this Euro will take. And Pat, I'll come to you next here. Um, if you're a sickle like me, which I'm sure you are, I watched the last three races, both graded and the one at St. Cloud. And that St. Cloud race was very good. And as I touched on earlier, another Euro that likes to be tactically forward. She's um, She was been on the lead multiple you know multiple times in her career she wasn't far off at last time out and only lost by four and a half to sea silk road who absolutely ran away with that race if you watch the replay um everyone else and I, of course i'll let you talk about it as well pat but everyone else that was towards the front absolutely just faded away and really la mehana was the only one to kind of stick and uh stick towards the the line than anyone else up front which Adding, you know, that was at a mile and a three quarters. So distance should be absolutely no factor in this race. Yeah, no factor at all. And, you know, like you said, with the tactical speed, I looked at the last two races and I was just really impressed with her ability to, you know, find the race and stay in it. Um, You know, I think the only question I have with her is if, you know, this turf course at Gulfstream, probably the firmness is going to be of her liking. Like she's run over softer ground. Um, So, yeah, the connections, LSU Stables. I mean, I know, I'm pretty sure they own Farbridge. So the, both of yep. them, you know, uh, with the Clements, you know, I think they come in with intent. Uh, I think they, they she's going to run pretty well. And, you know, I will reiterate what you guys said. You know, I do agree with, you know, if you're playing horizontals, having both, you know, Mikulik and La Mahana is kind of difficult to do. But um, I, I don't know. I just, I'm a big fan of Mikulik, but I, I just think, Saturday might not be her day. And I think maybe, you know, Chad's looking um, maybe at the end of the Keeneland meet for like the bewitch or something as sort of, I hate to call it a prep because this is a big race, but you know what I mean? I, I think that another step. Yeah. I mean, look, it's awful long layoff. I mean, it's with Chad as t- Paul touched on, it's not necessarily the biggest factor when you're coming off out of a barn like Chad on a layoff, mm-hmm. but the point's still there that she's coming off the breeders cup. We haven't seen her in, in four months. Now she's going to come back in this spot. And this Euro, we really don't have any idea what she's going to do. But Mark brings up a great point, and Howard hits on it as well. Um, that ra- last race she ran at, and that gr- at group one was 131 pounds. She gets 11 pounds off today. She's running at 120 rather than 131, which I'm not the biggest weight guy, but she hasn't run with 120 in three or four years. So that's definitely a point to keep in mind, especially when coming over to these, to the States for the first time. But Patrick also brings up a great point where, um, you know, will firm be what she wants. And I'm guessing that if they're sending her over to the, uh, to the Clement stable, uh, LSU bought her, I'm assuming that they are going to want her on firm ground, but we'll obviously see on Saturday, but we kind of, we kind of really hit on everybody guys. There's not too much else, obviously seven horse field to go into, but even though it's a seven horse field, it's definitely a great race with a lot of different ways and a lot of different horses you can have on top as shown by the horses <coughs> we have on the bottom. So I'm going six, one, eight with McCulloch on top. Patrick's going one, four, six with La Mahana on top. Paul's also going McCulloch on top six, three, eight. Charlie's going the four surprisingly on top four, six, eight and Noah who we didn't really get, didn't obviously had the three on top. So didn't get to talk too much. But um, who do you want to – do you have anyone you want to throw in third here, Noah, before uh, I move just, on? Just throw the one in there. All right. Nice and easy, nothing creative, but 3-6-1 for Noah on his picks in race number 10 uh, for his race, the Orchard Stakes. Uh, race 11, guys, moving on to Goldstream, the Goldstream Park Oaks as I bring up the Equibase right now. And this is a, much, this is a field of nine, and there is one – horse in here that if you follow if you've been following the philly division for the last you know last half a year maybe even last year you'll know this name ways and means comes back into this spot for irad chad brown uh and as you could see by the picks all of all the <laughs> bet and boozing guys are going with her on top but i know one guy that likes to beat favorites coming off the layoff and it is the man that brings the wisdom so i'll let him talk first and no i'll let you talk after that to talk about ways and means but paul is going with the number six gun song on top vlasquez and hennig your third your second choice at four to one and into champagne is your third choice for leperu and ian wilkes but paul my friend you're the one that has the floor why are we all going to be wrong and why is the number six gun song going to win on saturday 
Well, I mean, just to start, I mean, Ways and Means, I don't know that there was a bigger buzz horse at Saratoga last year, certainly not in the right. Philly division. And, you know, the first race was tremendous. And, you know, um, but, got, you know, got beat on the square. It did have trouble, had trouble in the in the spin away. But Bright Work was just a horse for course up there. Bright Work looked tremendous. You know, half to highly motivated, who was second in the 21 Bluegrass. So that says... The distance should be okay. But practical jokes, progeny's average winning distance is under six and a half furlongs. I don't know. This is the type of horse. She could be she could be anything. She could be a superstar. I think you're supposed to try to beat her in this spot. And if you get your head handed to you, it's not the first time. Uh, I went with Gunsong. Uh, I figured the price uh, right about where I see it now for the first time. Uh I think this horse put, has put two good races together, um, both this year, both in the mid-80s, uh, which is right there. I mean, Ways and Means opened with that 90, but uh, if if Ways and Means doesn't progress off the layoff, which is possible, I don't know. I, I, I'm looking to try to beat her, and again, she could just be anything. She was headed for the juvenile Phillies and got mm-hmm. sidetracked after that spin away. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Chad doesn't run them when they're not ready. So uh, I, I have no doubt that she'll be ready. But, you know, it is it is two turns for the first time. She is going to be mm-hmm. a heavy favorite. We go back to our good friend Harvey Pack about betting a, betting a favorite doing something for the first time. So I, I'm going to, you know, I will certainly use her defensively in horizontals, but I think Gunsong uh, advances a little off this. I like seeing Mark Henning with a good horse. And look at, they paid $400,000 for this horse. And frankly, Mark Henning doesn't get a lot of horses that are, that are $400,000 yearling. So good for him. And, and I'm going to try to beat the big Philly here. Right. And I mean, you're talking, if you want to talk sires, Paul, you're talking Gunrunner versus Practical Joke. And as we know, gen- very generally speaking, Practical Jokes don't like to go two turns and they ha- don't usually like to go over a mile, mile and a, or a mile and a 16th. They're a lot better going, you know, that one turn six, seven. So another way, another thing on the uh, on the record to try and beat ways and means. But no, I'll go to you uh, next, man. I mean, just I mean, Chris. Uh, who said that in the chat? Colin Quinn said ways and means on debut might have been the most impressive two year old I've ever seen in person. And a lot of people were thinking that at Saratoga for me, you know what um, I have? We all have ways and means on top, so I won't sugarcoat it. They do have do gooder in, in front by a while, but ways and means should be sitting right off. I almost think she kind of just gets the trip and those workouts definitely seem like she's ready to do it. If there was another opportunity for her to get points for the Oaks after this, I would be 100% for playing against her. But the fact that she has to most likely finish first or second, I think Chad's probably going to have her ready. Uh, So I I just, it's a little tough for me to mess around considering I don't see a ton of of weapons to try and kind of beat her. I do think Gunsong is very talented. Um, uh, for my sake, I do hope that Ways and Means runs really well and that she gets bet in the Oaks because uh, I'm a big Tarifa guy. So if that's the case, <laughs> then I would be very happy. And looks like Paul would too. Well, yeah, so absolutely. Say, someone, someone I know, someone that loves the uh, the all blue. So definitely absolutely. is on that board. And I mean, I mean, we've talked about it before. I mean, we're all. I'm also a very big Tarifa fan and for like a lot of Phillies that haven't really, you know, put themselves out there this year in this division. um, Tarifa is definitely probably your front runner going towards the Oaks, but uh, Pat, I'll go throw to you and then we'll kind of, we'll go to Charlie for final thoughts, but you also have ways and means on top, but the number five into champagne is a horse we haven't really talked about yet. Um, Ian Wilkes um, hasn't been winning it too much recently. Lep Rouge coming over for this uh, for this ride was second in the Devona Dale to a horse also in here, Fiona's Magic, but um, a lot lower on the morning line. It looks like um, a little bit more well meant for me. Yeah, a hundred percent. You know that was a tough start in the Devona Dale. Uh, you know from the outside draw and then breaking out and just completely veering out and having to come back in. It was tough. Uh, so I thought she still ran uh, pretty big. Um, and the pace was pretty tepid that day, uh, so it was really hard to run into, and I thought Fiona's magic had it her way. 
Uh, so I think she'll be able to rebound from that. And uh, I, I, I do think uh, hits the board and gives ways and means a run for her money. And that's why I have her uh, in second. Uh, and right. the, the only thing I would say about ways, ways and means, um, and you guys hit everything. So I'm just going to say she was, uh, that horse is just beautiful. Seeing her in the paddock that day, I was actually with Brad Anderson. You guys all uh, left to head home. It was that Sunday she ran. And I, I just, I've never seen uh, a more like pretty horse, just really, really pretty horse. So, I'm hoping she runs well and we can maybe see her in the Oaks or something like that. Running for the pretty I'd like to and... say for the record, Patrick, I did not I may not have been in the paddock, but I, I don't I don't get home from Saratoga on Sunday morning anymore. <laughs> I was definitely there. Hey, I'll tell you what, Paul. If I can drive to Saratoga, you'll I mean you wouldn't catch I wouldn't miss a Sunday either. I'll tell you that much. Yeah. Um but one way or another, I sadly. Hey Kyle, uh, one thing. Years. Can I mention one more thing? Yeah, you absolutely. know this Fiona's magic. Uh, if you go two races back to the forward gal, she was r- ridden really hard to get to the lead, in what turned out to be a fairly decent, a good pace. Ran a good second, came back last time, and the pace was appreciably slower, and and went wire to wire. Um, you know, I, I'm not saying I love the horse, but. Yeah. She looked pretty game to me in both spots and the type of horse that if she were to get on an easy lead, which would be hard to do in this race, but uh, I, I thought she looked like a pretty tough customer the last two. I mean, realistically speaking, um, this horse is going to be some, more of a price than any of the horses we've talked about so far. And isn't she going to get a good trip too? I mean, if she if do good she or, as fast as she is for Antonucci, um, Fiona's Magic should realistically be right off of her. Um, either pressing the pace or being just in behind ways and means will be a little bit farther back. So gen- uh, generally speaking, she should get the jump. Charlie, I'll kind of throw it to you for final thoughts. You have Fiona's magic in second, which is a great lead in. Um, is that kind of what you were thinking as well? Yeah, this is a horse that, you know, I I've liked before I was completely wrong in that our Harper's uh, Rose race where you loved that horse. Uh, but yeah, I mean, what honestly impressed me is I get that there's a lot of forwardly placed horses that want to go. But what I like about Fiona's magic was the horse was extremely game last time out, had every reason and understandability, you know, being on that lead the whole time to give it up. And for a speed horse trying to stretch out once again, you know, you kind of just assumed that, you know, the horse was going to have nothing on the like, on the tournament in the stretch. But I just love how game this horse is and how, you know, the efforts continue to be steps forward. The works are solid, too. I think Fiona's magic could be very interested and surprised because, again, I just think if it does become one of those, you know, gutted out races, Fiona's Magic could honestly get it down now that we've seen the horse has been able to fight tough competition. Again, I think Ways and Means is the horse to beat, but this is one where, you know, kind of like Paul said, I would use the horse in the horizontals to play it safe, but if you're betting this race vertically, I wouldn't touch that horse. Um, And then, yeah, again, I also really like the six. I was kind of back and forth between putting the eight and six for second and third. I just – uh I, I really liked what I've seen from Gunsong again. Another one who, after those first two performances, weren't anything to get excited about, really took steps forward in those last two efforts. And uh, again, working forwardly, I also liked again that this is kind of one of those that was able to sit just off. And then last time out, after being just off the lead, one going away. So I think if, you know, Gunsong or Fiona's Rose, you know, whichever one of them can kind of be able to sit just off that speed and get that first jump could be very dangerous here. Absolutely, and that's strike two if you're counting at home for Charlie on horse names today. It's Fiona's magic on the outside, oh, Fiona's, um, so but we'll see if we get to strike three by the end of this show. But Howard, uh, last thing, Howard says, none of you had knuckleheads even my top choice in your top three. Oh. So I don't know. That makes things easy. <laughs> my, oh, nice. So All right. All he have, that, the one? Gonna, I was going to say the one, the, the, the one or the two, maybe? I, I would have guessed maybe the nine. I would have guessed the nine, maybe. Um the yeah. nine last time was in a race where no one really closed and they, they ran that way around the track, but well, I you mean, know what? You can tune in tomorrow night and he'll tell you the hell with him. Let's move. Oh, and he puts it in the <laughs> chat. He thinks that it's number one, Paul. It's number one. Oh boy. Power squeeze for, uh, for Jorge. Why Delgado doesn't he get his own Francisco. show, Kyle? Oh, he has. It. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I know what he's putting it in our show. That's what I'm saying, Paul. <laughs> I can't get that. Kyle, it's 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 like stalking now. <laughs> can't get away from him. You see, Sierra Leone, Thursday, so. Sierra Leone, and I need a restraining order. <laughs> oh my god! Well, you're lucky that we're gonna we're gonna keep him here with the pool party, so he can't go down to the bluegrass to to see. No, him but he's threatening. Him. He's threatening to try to see her 
the Saturday morning of the grade one gamble. Yeah. Oh, oh I, I heard that I one. I didn't know that. Yes. I didn't yeah. hear that one. Oh, boy. <laughs> got to keep him. He's reaching out to connections to make sure that he will still be there. Arm's length, arm's length. Yeah, but he still remember. He's gonna have to get connections to get on the back stretch. He was with me last year, and I am not bringing him near that horse. He can do <laughs> it on his own. God love him. I can. After, there's too much at stake here. That's say not after what happened last year with uh, the big gray that we all know. But either way, guys, let's move on. I'm going four yes. five six. I'm going four five six in the Gulfstream Park Oaks, and I'm waiting for the ticker to go so I can see Patrick's picks. Uh, Paul's going six five four. Patrick's going four six five. Charlie's going four eight six, and Noah's going four six nine. Guys, moving over to race number twelve, and that is the Sand Spring Stakes, mile and the sixteenth on the turf for fillies and mares, four year olds old and up. So the older fillies and mares, it draws a field of nine. Originally drew a field of ten, now a field of nine. The number four Jan's girl has been early scratched from, and that one was that one's. Um, was later than when I did these, so that one just came in. But either way, field of nine, no one has her on top, but as I bring up the picks now, two of us have the number eight on top, market segmentation for Chad coming off the layoff at seven to five. That's myself and Patrick. I'll give my reasons why, of course. Number six, Cairo Consort, Paul and Charlie have on top, and Noah going a little bit out of the box with the number one, Candy light for Edgar Zayas and Noah. I'll let you start here. You're the one, yeah. you're the odd one out. So we'll let you go first. <laughs> Safi Joseph, if I remember correctly, and I'll bring up the picks, uh, the PPs right now. This is a newly trained horse, or no, no, that's the nut, that's the one after this. I lied either way. Candy light, Safi Joseph coming out of the honey fox, where Char one of Charlie's favorite horses that he likes to claim for himself, Chili Flag. Um, won that last race and definitely um, could get set up here with a lot of pace involved in this race. Yeah, I thought there was going to be a decent amount of pace. Um, so I ended up going with Candy Light. Um, I don't know if she was necessarily going to win that Honey Fox, um, but I think I, I think the, the shutoff in the comments is pretty accurate. I mean, she got she had room to run and then she didn't. Um, but I, I think uh, she's going to get a similar trip kind of before that accident. Uh, kind of being down on the inside from the one hole, uh, and hopefully she kind of finds room. I was kind of in between her or uh, the favorite market segmentation, but uh, I'll take prep for Keeneland for 500, Alex. <laughs> we're even bring, we're even see, we're bringing in all the uh, are you is that a, was that an old guy? Uh, was that an old guy reference for the man in the sure. room? Either a Jeopardy, sure. either way, this is your horse you're looking at right here, the number two on the inside, and the trouble was right there. I mean, you'll see she has room to run in, and you'll see the, um, this horse right here in the colors. You'll see there is running room, and all of a sudden – oh, no, it's the nine. And then all of a sudden, there's not. There's no running room at all on the inside. Maybe not to win, but definitely had run to either get in the money uh, one way or another, but definitely trouble in that race. But, Paul, I'm coming, I'll am coming. i go to you next here. As you have the number six on top, as my dear F likes to lag nowadays, me and Howard – Share that problem. Either way, number six, Cairo Consort, another one that looks to benefit from that pace pressure ball. Yeah, not unlike uh, the one I, I thought Noah's pick was very interesting. I had in my notes, you know, pace dependent, and, and you could say the same thing for this six that I picked. Although I think the six might be a tad more forward. Uh, I think that race last time was a pretty good race. Uh, I, I liked our Cali Kim in that race that we just talked about, she scratched and Anatolian as, as Patrick pointed out, I think Patrick talked about mm -hmm. Anatolian. Um, I, I got a feeling that could be a key race. The, the, the very one, the name <laughs> of the stakes is the very one. So you have to say the, the very one, um, you know, the, the Pegasus the just throw thing, right but... out, throw right out. Uh, you know, that's a running with the, the monstrous, uh, Didia and, uh, you know, the race before at Gulfstream, the, the the race to kick off the long layoff, I thought came back running. You know, Irad stays. Um, yeah, I I I think market segmentation is going to be very tough. I I believe in my multis in this race. I'm strictly six eight, so uh, I won't be going any deeper than that. Even I may have a C, but as far as the A line, nothing but six eight for me. And I and I'm going to take the six at a little bit of a price compared to the eight. Yeah, I mean, Charlie, you completely agree with him. You think six eight 
as well. I'll let you touch on anything you want to touch on with Cairo Concert, and then I'll kind of lead into Patrick and I's top pick with the eight market segmentation. Yeah, I really kind of like Paul said. We've been kind of locking stuff on a few of these races now. Where I, really I love Charlie. Charlie's my favorite. You know that. <laughs> well, because we're the sharps. But yeah, I really go too much. This, I, I really do think this is kind of just a two horse race. That's how if I play the horizontals, I would play as well. Um, again, just from the verticals angle, I think there's a lot more value with Cairo Concert than what you're getting on market segmentation. I also just like Cairo Concert's, you know, consistent experience at Gulfstream. And, uh, you know, this is a horse that I've been off for a very long time. I mean, this is always a play against. I don't think I've actually been on the Cairo Concert, you know, bandwagon advocating for this horse since like, you know, April of last year. So it's been a while, but I finally feel like this is actually the right spot. I think, you know, Todd and I, I think Todd will fully see him probably figure this out. I Red's ready to go with this horse again. I just think some of these past efforts were just, you know, obviously on Pegasus Day was just too tough of a field. Last time out, just wanted to try something new and go with a big stretch out. And the horse ran fine. I just don't think that's what Cairo Concert wanted. I think this is a good spot. I think this field is very beatable. Uh, for me, I think this is where if Cairo Concert kind of ends that losing streak and gets back on track, I feel like it's got to be here. Um, again, I think market segmentation is obviously very talented. Certainly have to factor in a little bit of, you know, the layoff. And how how well this horse will come back. I mean, obviously, again, Chad probably pointed to the spot and will have the horse ready. Uh, again, for me, I just I don't love those odds, and I I think Cairo Concert could be in form and you know get it done here. I mean, look, I don't disagree with you. I think she's very interesting. I have her in third, but Pat, you want to talk about Chad Brown bringing his big hitters back for for this day and with Ways and Means last race market segmentation comes into this spot. Running, I mean, one's won the New York last year on the lead. I mean, just you can argue who, you know, I mean, she kind of just did that by herself, but she did beat Didia and McCulloch in that race. And that's not necessarily the worst track record um, to be on. She lost the Diana at Saratoga and has been off since. So that's, I mean, that's a lengthy layoff. Obviously, very good company kept in the Diana, but, um, this is one of Chad's best, uh, older mares now with a lot of them. Um, kind of filtering out, but market segmentation, if she's ready, as the others have pointed out, she should be pretty tough. Yeah, she, she wasn't uh, winning the Diana just with the way the pace was set up, it just, you know, with, in Italian in there. So, you know, not that I tossed that race grade one, but I, I just, that was tough for her. So I look at her, you know, she's two for two at Gulfstream, won this race last year. Yep. Um, it's just extremely versatile. She could figure out her spot with Jose and, you know, I know we're not going to get a good price on her, but, you know, just been a big fan of her. And, you know, I had her big time in the New York. So when she uh, cut those fractions and just was able to hold off Didia, that was really nice. Yeah. And I, Mark puts out a good point. Two for two, for horse for course angle. I know Paul likes to talk about on the main show that he was kicked off this week. But um, as Pat brings up, did win the race last year in the Sand Springs on April 1st. Uh, did have I read aboard, but Jose's been riding her the past uh, the past two races. So the fact that Jose's on instead of I read this race doesn't concern me one bit. I think that's who just Chad is using with this horse. But again, longer layoff. It's Chad. It doesn't really um, hurt too much. This horse will be forwardly placed. So the Gulfstream turf doesn't concern me with this horse. If market segmentation is ready, guys, I mean, just call spade a spade. I think she wins. I think she's in a very tactical plate a tactical place in this race we'll get the jump on Ky uh, horses like Cairo consort um and should finish with a flurry and hopefully win with Cairo consort my thinking is Cairo consort will come late but maybe for about second or third I have the number nine fastest flight in second just for the sole reason that this horse will also be forwardly placed at a price for Marty for Marty Drexler now coming uh first time training this horse off of Brian Lynch the whole th my my whole angle with this horse is trip. If this horse can sit a good trip right in behind the speed or pressing the pace, I think this horse has a chance. But we'll definitely need to improve to beat to beat horses like Market Segmentation and Cairo Consort. Complete trip play on my part. But let's keep this train moving, guys. I'm going eight nine six. Paul's going six eight one. Patrick's going eight five six. Charlie's going six eight seven. And Noah's going one eight nine. Guys, gonna move over to race number 13 it's for the hometown crew the appleton stakes going a mile 
on the turf at Gulfstream Park. And this is this is where post positions really come into play, guys. As Howard point, put in the chat earlier, is this is Howard's infamous horse that he gave out on our show, his play of the year running a crisp two buyer that day. Oh, Churchtown, this is the horse we're talking about, the 11 on the outside. Your morning line favorite is the number four, Big Everest for Joel Rosario and Christophe Clement. Second choice will be the number three, Ice Shuck a lot for Paco Lopez and Mark Cassie. Third choice being the number five. Never surprised Irad and Pletcher have that one. As I switch over the picks right now, guys, this actually really surprised me. Four of us are going with the number three, Ice Shuck a lot. The only one outside the fray is Patrick. Patrick is going with the number five. Never surprised. And that is where we start, Patrick. You're going to have to tell us why we are all going to be wrong. But never surprised, a pretty good price at five to one. Yeah, I was really surprised uh, uh-huh. the way he <laughs> teacher way teacher he... jokes teacher jokes everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, right, the man in the on. chat. We, we seem to be making Ooh, this man. Horse indirectly <laughs> and directly all night. Let's uh, horse ran huge last out. Um, you know, to only get nailed at the wire. Uh, you know, I thought that was impressive. Uh, that was off the layoff as well. You know, I think another step forward puts him squarely in the mix. The mix in this spot, you know, has been working pretty well. I, I just, you know, with the three, yeah, you know, I do see it, but it wasn't just not a fan. So I'm hoping, you know, with the pace, this is going to be, you know, I do think it's going to be a quicker pace. I'm not sure yeah. what time form has that's, going. And it says that exact thing, and that's what I wanted to bring up. Also, real quick, guys, Howard is putting polls in the chat. You guys should be voting on them. And if you, the question right now is which trainer will put win the 150th Kentucky Derby. And if you put anything but Chad Brown, you're banned. Let's just point that out. Anyway, Paul, going to you next, my friend. You will have the three like the rest of us. Number three, Ice Shuck a lot for Mark Cassie and Paco Lopez. That last race, you, um, I was all, I was, I had her, I had him, excuse me. I corrected myself, didn't count. Um, was wide in that race. I liked her that time. I like her coming back. Um, very formidable on numbers, and I think she could get a trip. Well, I think, you know, I have my notes fast pace, but with the yeah. name of the race, Kyle, the Appleton, <laughs> shouldn't it be a slow pace? <laughs> no kidding. I mean, I don't <laughs> Anyway, I digress. Um, no, I, I, think, uh, I think this race is going to not only be one from behind, but, you know, might – fall apart a, a little bit. Although I did keep never surprised Patrick's horse. Uh, I did keep that horse in second, but yeah, I think this uh, ice uh, truck a lot is pretty good. The only thing is the, the horse can't keep a jockey. This is the sixth, uh, sixth different jockey in six races. Yep. And I know he wins at a high percentage of Gulfstream, but I am no P Lopez fan, mainly for the way he rides, but that's another story for another day. You know, uh, looking back, uh, what? Uh, well, no, I don't mind him looking back. I don't <laughs> like when he puts other riders in danger well, recklessly. That's but that's yeah, another that's story for another day. Um, mm-hmm. I think uh, I do think that race uh, was good. To your point, uh, Kyle, uh, the Emmanuel race last time, third off the layoff. Um, I, I don't love the horse, but I I do think there's going to be a little some type of chaos in this race, and and I think this horse is going to be running at the end. I mean, we all agree with you. No, I'll go to you next. I mean, anything you want to touch on, I think Paul hit it pretty well, but I shock a lot. We all like her at nine to two. Him. Yeah. I I, him. He, Cheers to everybody. I said him. <laughs> said her again. You said her about uh, nine times, by the way. You'll be shit faced yeah, yeah, by the time I, you're done. <laughs> as long as we're not Can taking I say shots, no? Paul. Did I say fine. that word? Sorry. 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 This is the fun show, Paul. It's fine. This is the fun oh, show. Oh, okay. Good. Oh, that's right. I'm, I'm free. <laughs> Judging by the picks on the bottom of the screen, uh, I have very a little belief that Ice Chuck a lot will be nine to two on Saturday. Yeah. Um right. and, and for good reason. Uh, you know, in the comeback race in January, uh he, he closed nicely into a slow pace. And then in, in the uh, grade three last time going a mile sixteenth, uh he was three four wide the entire time. And I think the mile of 16th is a little too far for him. You, you look back in his uh, his previous races. I mean, he was a sprinter for quite a while. He was in the Jiper uh, in the summer and in and, and some really nice races up at Woodbine. Uh, so I think, you know, the 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 mile is going to suit him a lot better than the mile of 16th does. You know, with that, 
third off the layoff, although I'm not a huge fan of Paco, he's very capable um, in a wide open race. I think, I think this is the one that I want and it looks like everybody else wants him too. Yeah. And Charlie, I'll go to you next. Um, you have the number and we'll talk, start talking about other, other horses underneath. You have the number eight sky road, a good price horse. That's run really well in synthetic down there. who I actually liked in one of those races that we covered on the show. And then the number one, also you have country final, both at a price. So anything you want to touch on before I shock a lot, and then we'll move on to, uh, your underneath horses. Yeah, I mean, I th certainly think the morning lines uh, that was made for this race was a little bit interesting, especially going with the horse that's, you know, off a layoff as the 7-2 to favorite who none of us have. You know, one of us has in our top three, and, you know, not even this horse as the favorite is interesting to me. Um, I mean, look, the reality is the fact that none of us know, and I know this too well, none of us have quality G, so I think we all know who's going to win this race now. Quality G is just going to fly out of the clouds, get dropped down on the wire and first by a nose, and Ice Chocolate's going to lose by a nose, and no one and I are going to lose it. Uh, but it's okay. Uh, yeah, in terms of other horses, I mean, look, Skyro, it's kind of just the same thing for me with Skyro and, uh, you know, with the one county final. These two horses just always, always, always beat me, and they always find a way to just get great trips and be right there. So I just threw them in there because this race is wide open. They're going to finish somewhere realistically in the money. No one's going to be able to explain how, but they're very consistent horses. Obviously, the question is going to be the switch from the synthetic to the turf, but I think they both can handle it. They both run very consistent races with solid figures. Neither one you can really point at to having, you know, a bad effort. And there's still, at least I'd say with County File, maybe a little more up final, maybe a little more upside just because this horse can kind of be forwardly placed and also has shown more upside on turf, I would say. Uh, but yeah, I just think Ice Chocolate's the horse to beat. I This horse has been close, has got a few solid wins as well. When we get to best bets later, I'll talk more about it. And the jockey gymnastics don't really concern me too much. The horse is working forwardly. Obviously, the question, I mean, the good news is since this horse isn't forward, Paco won't be looking back. The question is, is he going to be too busy, you know, cracking a cold one on the turn and easing the horse and then being like, maybe we should pick up? Or will he understand he has to get on with it right away? We'll have to wait and see. Uh, but yeah, I think Ice Chocolate should win if everything goes well. I mean, look, we all agree with you, uh, but I'm sure Paul agrees with you on the Paco point as well. To right at the wires point, since with all that pace, how can you not take a price? I mean, I don't think that's far off of it, but I just think the problem is, is that the horse we all like is going to sit the favorable trip coming from the back. So the fact of the matter is that even though the horse is going to end up being three to one, the horse has the closing power to get it done. Will be on, will be towards the rail as this race at a mile. There's a very short run to that Goldstream first turn. So you want to be the outside, pretty much outside of, I mean, what, eight is almost dead unless you want to just completely drop out the back and kind of make your run late, which is which is what Smoke and Tea is going to have to end up doing. Probably sit somewhere mid-pack. Title Forces is going to really have to work from that outside gate. And how and the Howard Kravitz Special Church Town, I mean, what's this horse going to do? This horse is going to have to um, probably run a Connaughton Cup type of race where he's going to have to drop out toward the back uh, or mid pack and try to make his run at the end. Otherwise he's really going to have to try and use, especially with the 10 to his inside. Uh, the reason for those of you that don't know, Howard came on the betting and booze and show, whatever episode it was uh, for this Kentucky downs race and gave out church town as his like pick of the year last year. All time for, ice cold take. All, all time. <laughs> it's an all time <laughs> take. And this horse runs 96, 96, 95 comes on the show. Horse runs a two. And then comes back and slight, slight regression, 92. just a slight regression. It, Paul, it worked. You had the, the balloons again. I don't know if you saw that. That's a that's an old meme for those of you that have been around a long time. The, the balloons were signifying that Churchtown just recently finished that Kentucky Downs race. <laughs> you might, yeah, that's I'm, I'm with that. That's a good one, Paul. I love that. Either way, oh um, a lot of different ways you can go in this race, guys. But we're going to keep moving on, and this is the big race. And Howard, if you can get the poll work in here for a little bit, I'm going to – or we'll just get in the chat because I want everyone to put in. So next race, of course, guys, is the four, is race 14. It's the Florida Derby. Field of 11, morning line favorite, is the two-year-old champion. Fierceness, John Velasquez, Pletcher rides, Rapoli stable, 8-5 to five on the morning line, which we'll see if that horse actually is even close to 8-5. to five. Um, Third, Second choice is the number nine, Conquest Warrior, Jose rides, Shug McGahee trains number two, Hades, your fountain of youth winner, third choice, Paco Lopez and Joseph Orseno at seven to two guys. We're going to play a game here. How many in the chat put how many people you think took fierceness on top? I want to see in the, I want to see numbers in the chat. 
obviously it's there, there's at least one of us i'll give you that one two three four or all five of us how many people do you think have fierceness on top and i want to see numbers in the chat so i'll give it a few seconds guys and we'll see what pours in david barista only going with one uh fierceness on top howard says four people mark bogas says one person as i'm on top steven vanderbrook three paul conlin two eric anderson one Right at the wire must be talking about Charlie, the number one. Oh, goes good, one. No, no that, that's you, Kyle. S. Robbie, thanks so much for doing the show. Don't think I've seen that name before. It goes four. Matt Miller says zero. Phil R. And you already, face. Did you already say it was at least one? Yeah, I did say it was at least one, so Matt didn't <laughs> follow the rules. Council of Miller has to pay closer attention. No, it, it just means one of the people <laughs> here, he won't reveal who. He doesn't count their vote. That's all it means. Whoever, whoever, yeah. whoever put them on top, they don't count. Yeah, that's right. Phil R., another new name. Thanks so much for doing the show. Steven Scott says two. Paul putting his vote in the chat says two. Tom says two. Ralph says three. Janet says two. Gregory Young, another new name. Thanks so much for joining in. Says three. Sean Kane says two. Guys, one of us. One of us has fierceness on top, and it's not me. It's not Charlie, and it's not Paul. It's not Ooh. Noah. It is the man all the way on the right. It is Patrick Consul. Going with fierceness on top, but funny enough, guys, all the rest of us have the second choice on top. We all have Conquest Warrior on top, and we'll talk about obviously for various reasons. Does this Patrick, mean I'm getting fierceness at like two to one on on Saturday? Like, yeah, it's like uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, if, I mean, if all the astute people, you know, this horse has got to be even money, right? It has I, to be. Yeah, I mean, there's no way. I've honestly with think. There could be a lot of hate, but I don't think that horse shifts above six to five, let alone even money. But Pat, I mean, look, there's not too much to say about the two-year-old champion, but you're here to tell us why we're wrong. Yeah, listen, I mean, there isn't too much to say. I, I just think he's, to be quite honest, the best horse. I mean, you know, I looked last out in the Holy Bull. Yeah, what a crap of a race. Um, you know, I think Hades is not very good, um, and, you know, it's kind of, a knock on fierceness, but if this horse can just regain its mid to nineties buyers, this horse should win. Um, going away, in my opinion. No, I look at where they're gonna, how fierceness is gonna win this race. Um, be forwardly placed. Uh, definitely sit right off Hades uh, on the lead, and hopefully, you know, this horse can revert back to its past form. Because if not, um, Mr. Rapoli, uh, St. John's Red Storm fellow Red Storm fans, gonna have a lot to say about this horse. I mean, Paul, we'll go to you and then we'll kind of move this conversation into Conquest Warrior. People are going to say, oh, it's fierceness this time because it's, you know, every other race, quote unquote. I'm not, let's not sugarcoat it, Paul. Like that last race, even though it was off a layoff, that last race was bet was bad. It was, it was not very good at all. He's going to have to improve back to those numbers. Like he ran, like the race he ran in the juvenile to be, to, not that this field's, you know, has any really world beaters in it, but. Um, he's going to have to go back, find something to go back to those races. Yeah. And it, I'll tell you, it's a fascinating race just because of him. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you got right. you, you're with him or you're against him. And, um, you know, Hey, look, we all saw that Bre Breeders' Cup juvenile race, but you know, was that the anomaly? Um, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think the horse could be really, really good, but I think there's almost an equal chance that, He's just okay um, or good, but, you know, good doesn't win on the first sad day in May, at least in the 13th at Churchill. Um, I don't know. You'll see my pick five. I, you know, I think if you're playing caveman here, you better make a decision. Um, and my caveman I did, I'm going to try to beat him with an army of, of people, and, and if he wins, he wins. Having said all of that and, and based on our picks, you know, relative to their accomplishments, there's a chance Conquest Warrior is vastly overbet in this yes, race. Correct. Um, because you know it's nice that he wasn't up for a claim last time in that optional claiming race, but mm -hmm. there's a long way. The only thing is it's Shug and uh by back to back, you know, matching buyer tops. Uh he's high on this horse. They paid a million dollars for this horse. Um Shug is really, really good. Um, so 
that's the antidote to the over bet. But, you know, the horses looked very impressive the last two times, and it, it's pretty simple. If fierceness is that good, as, as Patrick says he is, and he could very well be right, then they're all running for second. But if he isn't, I think any number of horses could win the race, and I thought Conquest Warrior was the most logical. Yeah, and no, I'll go to you. I love all the points, Paul. It's absolutely spot on to what I was thinking. No, I'll go to you next. Obviously, you're thinking the same thing as everyone else, 9 10 um, with this. But one thing he put, um, one thing Mark Bogas points out, which obviously this is usually the Pete angle that we see on uh, Thursday shows, but Conquest Warrior, no late six the first. Granted, it was in the mud, so there's a lot of conniving factors in why he might have not run well that day at Aqueduct. No Lasix, get Lasix the next two races, and now it's off Lasix again. Does the Lasix angle kind of play anything with you? And if not, kind of just lead into what you like most about Conquest Warrior and anyone else you want to talk about is you're the only one that has the one in their top three. Yeah, um, it, the Lasix angle is definitely something to have a note of. Um, typically in my handicap, I don't pay too much attention to it. Um but it could be legitimate. I mean, for me, Conquest Warrior is more of a – I like him from a visual standpoint rather than the numbers that he's kind of produced. Um, Kyle, there there could be – well, I was thinking that there could be a discrepancy in uh, pace figures uh, from buyer to time form. Um, and if time form kind of lines up Conquest Warrior a little more in favor and, and compared to fierceness, I think that might put him a, a little bit more into it. But I think, I think what Paul said is something to to keep note of because people are going to have the same idea, and they are going to bet this horse heavily just with the with the idea that they have they don't know what Fiercest is going to do. I mean, he could show the effort that he did in the juvenile, or he could show the effort where he just if he if he doesn't going to win, if he ain't going to win, he's not going to run at all. Um, yeah. But to the point, you know, there's this is a this is a value game, so. Uh, you know, it's going to be tough, you know, in terms of trying to find someone that can kind of get in there at a decent price because, you know, those two are definitely going to take money. And that's why I've got Frankie's Empire in third. Uh, shout out Charlie's brother. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, who I think is just a horse that's kind of naturally improving. You know, I'm not a huge fan of horses that have run so many times at this point in their career. But ever since that this horse got into the Yates barn, he won the swale impressively. I mean, he ran okay in the Fountain of Youth. They just kind of ran around the track that day with with Doorknock kind of taking him the whole way. Was, um, yeah. But it, it's it's classic Empire. You know, I, I think he could be better with distance. So just one that I'm kind of taking a chance on. That it, it just feels like you're going to get a way better price than you probably should. I mean, look, that's a fair. That's a very fair point. Like you said, I mean, that 84, I mean, that's exactly what the nine Conquest Warrior is running. And you're going to get him, you're going to get Frankie's Empire, what, five times the price at least? So, I mean, if you're taking that over bet angle that we've, that uh, Paul and, and everyone else has been pointing out, that's a great, I mean, look, that's a great value from a value standpoint. It's a great play. I don't mind it at all. And uh, I want to correct myself from earlier. I said that Hades won the Fountain of Youth. He won the Holy Bull, of course. I My mistake completely. Um, Charlie, that'll lead us into you. You, I have Hades in second as well. I'm really not sure what to do with this horse. You also have him in second. Um, I'll lead that right into you. Is your are you going completely off um, that race of the Holy Bull? Obviously, that allowance race is very good as well. But what are you kind of thinking with Hades? No, I was sold from the allowance race. I get that it's not the best competition, but I saw that huge step forward. I, you know, I talked about it when we covered the Holy Bowl. I thought Hades was extremely intriguing. Did I think the horse was going to win? Of course not. But I'm buying the hype. Do I think this horse goes on to win the Kentucky Derby? Hell no, of course not. But I think this horse could certainly win this race. But uh, ultimately, for me, the way I landed on it, and you know, this could be a hot take where then we look back, and I don't think it'll be as bad as Boss Man's Churchtown take, but it could still be bad. I don't buy the fierceness hype. You know. I get the debut was incredible. I get the race we witnessed was incredible. But for me, when I was helping decide in this race, and maybe this is me thinking too forwardly, but it was kind of just like, who can I see winning the Kentucky Derby in this field? And obviously, I get Sierra Leone's not in it. I guess Doorknock's not in it. But the only one in this field who I could truly be like, you know what? If that horse won, I could, I could, I could see it happening. For me, it's Conquest Warrior, and that's why I have this horse on top. I get that the buyer figures aren't incredible, but. For me, I see a horse that has so much room for improvement and can keep growing. That effort two back, I get it's a maiden race and the horse only won by half length. But if you watch that replay, that horse got 
maybe the worst trip I've ever seen. And nothing to Jose Ortiz's fault. The horse just couldn't catch a break. And it was actually a great call to actually watch at the time, just hearing how crazy uh, you know, they were going when this horse finally did get up because the horse had no business winning. He had no business winning two back and somehow still found a way to do so. And then the effort last time, again, I know it's a weak field, but looked just as impressive, not worried about the distance. And the big thing for me also is like fierceness, I feel like is a horse that, you know, can't face adversity. And when the horse has had to, has faltered. Conquest Warrior almost welcomes it adversity and is willing to, you know, take it head on and then find a way against all odds to get the job done. So for me, I love this horse here. Um, and again, I think this is one that you have to watch out for beyond this race as well. I think this is the, the horse to beat in this race and could be one of them in the future. Well, I don't obviously I don't disagree with you. And Howard brings and Howard brings up the same point. I think Conquest Warrior is ready to explode with a big buyer effort. Two horse race, in his opinion, and uh Conquest Warrior is the one to take due to value. Not sure how much value we'll actually get on the day. Um, but I completely agree with you. There's two things I want to point out here before we move on to our pick five and best bets. There's, this is a mile and an eighth at Goldstream. And even though it's a mile and an eighth, there it's a very short run up to that first turn again, just like the mile race we talked about on the turf last time. Fierceness is going to have to navigate that 10 hole uh, pretty quickly. And even though there's not too much speed to his inside with Conquest Warrior, you have number eight, Seminole Chief, who has early speed. The number six, Ladon Bro, who has early speed. There's a lot of horses to his inside that are going to give him a little bit of a uh, run for his money to that first turn. And if Fierceness is caught four wide, which I'm pretty sure he was last time in the Holy Bull around the first turn, he was wide. Um, like, there's no saying what, I mean, he's going to be what, even money, and you're going to want him going four wide around the first turn, even if he's a lot better than these horses and ends up being that going forward. That's no place you want to be. So that I feel like the post position is one thing to keep in mind. And even though Conquest Warrior kind of suffers that same fate, Conquest Warrior will be out the gate and dropping back, probably to that mid-pack area and probably only be too wide, whereas Fierceness is going to want to get towards the front and have a lot of challengers going forward. So I think the post position is going to be a big thing to keep in mind. And with Conquest Warrior, guys, I, li I love that Shigme Gehi put this horse in a mile and an eighth last time out. I think that was with intent. I think that was a prep for a race like the Florida Derby. If if he did end up running well, which obviously he passed with flying colors. And the it says ridden out, guys. It was not ridden out. The horse was geared down probably by the sixth by after this just after the 16th pole. Uh Jose was not moving the reins at all after this. So I'm not saying you know the writer's wrong, but it definitely was not he was not you know, pumping the reins the whole way through the finish line. So Conquest Warrior, I think he's primed for a big effort, will sit a really nice trip, and I think even though you won't get that much value, you'll get more value than the horse to his outside, and for that reason, I think he's the play in the Florida Derby. Guys, let's move on to best bets and pick fives, because of course we have a man coming from – the Thursday show where they give pick five. So I will give it, I will send it over to him first and then the boys will move on to their best bets of the entire card. And one bone to pick that I have with one of the guys on here. I'm sure since I said that he knows who it is, Paul pick five starting in race number 10, of course, going one, three, six with four, five, six with six, eight, three, five with two, four, six, eight, nine and under a hundred dollars adhering to the boss standards, no single, but there is one big name, as you kind of alluded to, that you're leaving out on your pick five ticket. Yeah, well, again, you know, in a caveman situation, you're not going to, you know, I don't know that you can use fierceness with a bunch of horses or even two. So uh, I'm going to try to gang up on them. You know, I'm going to try to get alive uh, to the last race and have five chances to beat him. I think he's beatable in the race and, you know, have a few logicals and, and a couple of probably illogicals. Uh, <laughs> as far as the rest of the sequence, uh, you know, I talked about that market segmentation race being only too deep there and um, only too deep. I believe I'm too deep in the uh, ways and means race, if that's correct. No, no, the, I'm three deep in that race. Yep. The fourth leg, the fourth leg, which is the uh, the slow paced Appleton. Uh, I am only too deep with the three and five. So, you, you know, again, uh, am I going to use fierceness in an ABC setup? Uh, yeah, not as an A. Uh, I won't have him as an A. And, uh, 
you know, let's see. Uh, I, I think Conquest Warrior could be a real player moving forward. All right. I mean, I completely agree with you. And I absolutely, I said this to the guys when you sent me this. I love that you're throwing out fierceness. I mean, you want to, you want, we talk about taking a stand all the time. And not only, not, does that, doesn't, that doesn't always have to happen when, you know, you're trying to single a horse in a race where there's an even money favorite and you really don't like them, especially in like a caveman setup. As Paul said, with an ABC, it's a little bit differently. It's, that's kind of weighing your opinions. In a caveman, everybody's on the same playing field. So, to take a stand, you throw out that even money favorite, you are able to c- increase your value because if the even money favorite wins, you're, I mean, you're getting a quarter of the payout than you would if you're getting any of these horses. And you're, you know, like say you're exponentially, uh, exponentially increasing your value because you're not using him, which then decreases the amount you bet and will increase the payout if one of those horses does come through for you. So I love that you're throwing out fierceness in that race and good luck with your pick five, Paul, on Saturday. Charlie, I'm yeah, going to you. Thing, no, go for it. Let me just, one last thing about that. You know, if you like some 20 to one shots earlier in the sequence, you know, you got to have fierceness on your ticket. I, I got a lot of logical horses early on. You know, you don't want to get a $48 right. winner and then be beaten by fierceness in the finale. So, you know, that's where the ABC uh, comes in, in play. But, you know, uh, on my ticket, yeah, you could add fierceness. It would only add... 20%, it would only add $18. But what leaving him off t- to me does, uh, it's allowing me to maybe to go three deep in a race earlier on that I was going to go too deep and maybe get a little more coverage there. So we'll see. Pat, do you want to say something real quick? Yeah, you know, Paul, I- I'll ask you or, you know, whoever wants to answer. Like, you know, if you have opinions early on too, I think that, you know, with um, the four ways and means, you know, I'm playing the pick four is my best bet. And I have the four um, and the eight market segmentation both singled. Um, and then I went deeper in the second to last leg. And then I went, I actually went deep in the derby because I think, you know, is fierceness made me vulnerable? Sure. But I, I would rather get to that race with two of my stronger opinions earlier on. And if fierceness wins, all right, well, I'm probably might make my bunny back, might not. If he loses, then I, I'm probably going to hit for pretty big. Especially because I'll play a press up with the ten singled. Well, except your two singles are going to be bet pretty pretty good. Correct. So if he if he loses, you're going to want to beat him with someone. If he loses the conquest warrior, you're not going to get paid big. Yeah. You know. I mean, no, uh, that's Ralph the- Conti brings up a good point, Kyle. The three yeah. is scratched in the first leg, but you Correct. know we'll deal with that later. I. I <laughs> uh, that was that I, was a. That was a surprise for uh, for Paul and Noah on the show. So this that was yeah. live time, of course. Buy the power picks if you want Paul's full uh, full caveman. Again, link in the description below if you want those. Charlie, I'll go to you next, and you're the guy I have a bone to pick because not only do you give a horse that you is one of your favorites as a best bet, you gave it to me in race four, race number four. A win on the number eight, Fredo, and in race 13, an ice cold double leading into the Florida Derby, ice chocolate into Conquest Warrior. Well, there's two things. Number one, why would you not want to be able to build up some easy money bankrolls so that you can use it towards pick five? And number two, I get there's the Florida Derby and all this, but we all know that the true featured race that everybody, our viewers are watching was just to see who was going to address the 25,000 allowance optional claiming going a mile 16th yep, on the turf. Right. So someone had to make sure to cover that for everybody who uh, you know has been hooting and hollering in the chat about who's going to cover race four. So I'll be the one who takes one for the team. Look, Fredo is an absurd value to me in that race. It's certainly wide open. I know there's no strong but in a field this week there's just no world where this horse is six to one you know this is a horse that wants to be forwardly placed and last time out missed the break and should have been dead and then came flying late and just missed uh against uh my sea cottage and then last time out obviously was the favorite and uh you know, or was one of the favorites and again, nearly got it, but lost to American Diamond who just got the dream trip and went by late. I think that horse is very live there. And that, again, for me, I know we've talked about earlier with the Ice Chocolate Race, some of these morning lines are questionable. Six to one is just outrageous on that horse. And then going into the last race, I mean, uh, sorry, my other bet, uh, the uh, Stone Cold Double again. Ice Chocolate, I know I'm not getting nine to two. I wish I would. I think that horse could honestly go off as the favorite, but in a race that is pretty wide open, that's the only one that truly sticks out to me that I can trust. You know, that's why all my other horses underneath are 
double digit odds and have quality G wins. I, just, I might have to go find a bridge. Um, and then going into the last race again, I love Conquest Warrior. I love Conquest Warrior. I love Conquest Warrior. I don't believe in fierceness. The horses are fraud. I love the underdogs. I love the ones that can face adversity. And I know from an odds perspective, Conquest Warrior isn't an, is an, an underdog, but you can kind of say the whole field is because fierceness is going to go off at even money. And I don't like that when, you know, fierceness had to eat a jab, the horse immediately went down and didn't want to go again. Uh, whereas I think Conquest Warrior will take the jab and say, punch me again and I'll go forward again. I love Conquest Warrior here. So I'm going to take that Stone Cold double and I'm basically committing a, a legal bank robbery when that hits. <laughs> Legal bank robbery. He says, hey, not to mention, hey, if you win and then you get three hours to put your pick five together. <laughs> yeah, there you go. No kidding, considering there's 14 races. Or, or I just wait until my leg double and I have even more time. Then I have hours upon hours to wait around. Just take you might, yeah, you, have a, you can take a five hour that. nap in between that. That's for damn sure. Either way, Charlie, good luck with yours. Noah, going to you. Two win bets for you. And again, Outside of the races we covered, fantastic. You guys are doing it really well here in the Sanibel Island race number eight. You're going with the win on number eight, Hello Hollywood, and the race 13, the horse we all like, win on number three, I Shuck a Lot. Yeah, I wanted to make sure that I had at least one race covered outside of the pick five because this is just a great card at Gulfstream Park. Um, but uh, so I went with the eighth race. Uh, the favorite in the race is Ozara, who I think just gets perfect tripped after perfect tripped. And if she doesn't, then she's very vulnerable. So I went with the, the Brian Lynch runner, the number eight, uh, Hello Hollywood, uh, from Mr. Hollywood himself, uh, who is stepping up from a main special weight victory. Uh, and Brian Lynch steps her up into the listed stakes race. Uh, and Irad hops on, who I think. Definitely had a choice to hop on to Ozara. So I think it's very interesting that he stays there. And then fast forward, not the three hours, just a little bit shorter to race 13, uh, who I ended up going with Ice Chuck a lot, who I am very confident in. Um, if you guys are fans of the show, you know, Kyle and I recorded a podcast or an episode for the Big Cap, Sandy yep. Handicap. Correct. Uh, and a horse that I was a very big fan of was Subsanador, who was a, a pretty decent price and just got pretty you know, decent the wire. And that's uh, that's all I need to say about that. Um, but that's that's been my play of the year so far. Uh, I suck a lot as a close second. Oh, he's putting in the he's putting in the boss. Uh, oh, he's done the boss. Man. Oh, you should have said month. You should have just said month. You should have just said month. You could have just said month. You shouldn't have said the word yes. year. Oh, All right, no. two fire incoming, that, ladies and gentlemen. And <laughs> what Mark points out is probably going to be eight to five now because of how much we love <laughs> yeah. ice suck a lot. But guys, well, after that, he might be even money. I mean, oh my god, play of the year. I mean, oh, even money, no kidding. But sub senator was 22 to one, I will point out. Or actually, it might have even been higher than that 28 to one, something like that. Well, if ice chuck a lot ends up dead on the board like that, I'll take it. Well, no, shit. um, my best bets, guys, I'm going ice cold in race number 11. Um, it is the two Chads that are going off layoffs, but I'll tell you what, Chad, this this day, Chad's really bringing his horses off the bench, and Chad searches for good spots for his horses. They're always well meant, and if these horses are ready, market segmentation looks like she could, as long as she gets a good trip in a race that has a decent amount of speed, she could set a really nice trip and, and win going away. Ways and means, if she runs back, and she if she's ready, which the workout's point out that she is and she runs back to those races last year she's also very formidable i'm hoping and get better prices off the layoff i'm hoping somewhere around six to one maybe somewhere i'm hoping obviously it's very for that double yeah for that say double? five six to one i've seen i've seen oh, the eight to huh. one go oh come on come on are you it's, serious it's not gonna be for that double the two I, chads i don't you think, think you're getting be, six to one I don't think I'm getting three to one. I will say that. Does someone have Disneyland music here? The <laughs> fantasy land. Is that one of the places in Magic Kingdom? Fantasy land? It is. Oh, youthful. Kyle, your youthful optimism is to be admired. <laughs> I Paul, when I get five to one and I'll cash it, I will I'll come back to you. But we'll see what happens. For Christ's sakes, I'll play it at five to one. And <laughs> I don't I, I'm not really liking ways and means. Well, that's hey, hey true. God love you. I hope you do. I think it's going to be closer to three to one. What well, it might be, right. but again, either way, I just think coming off that long layoff, I, I'm hoping for a little bit bigger of a price. If not, it is what it is. But I'm going ice cold race eleven four eight, and we all talked about how much we love Conquest Warrior five to two maybe. I mean, with fierceness being bet down, 
We'll see what happens. These are two lower price plays, but the fact that I feel so strongly about them, going to give them out. And I'm going, these are basically going to be my two only plays I play at Goldstream on Saturday, depending on if we go, if depending on how many, how long we sit in our call at StreamYard on Saturday and play the races. But I'm just going to take these two and hammer them all day long. And hopefully I can walk out up a few hundred, but we'll see what happens. Now that I got my annual, that's that'll sub in for your rant of the week, Paul, in this show is your berating of me, but it's okay. Oh, I no, just, I'm, I'm no, not berating I you. I, I, I think you're optimistic. That's all. No, that's, I, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. Paul Conlon, and it's there's nothing wrong with that. What's up, Charlie? What'd you say? I was saying he was just cooking you for a little. It's all good. Hey, and again, when the double goes up two to one, then I deserve it. Then it is what it is. But, Paul, thanks so much, man, for coming on the show. Greatly appreciate you joining us and of course they'll miss you tomorrow but you had more hopefully you had more fun on here anyway um it was actually it was a really fun show going back and forth between everybody but hope you had a well time. i appreciate it kyle and i appreciate you guys you know one thing that gives me great in all seriousness a great satisfaction and a couple of things i do patrick knows i'm heavily involved in the basketball refereeing and i, and I like nothing better than seeing young officials like Patrick come along. Patrick got an unsolicited full evaluation of one of his games on tape because I have no <laughs> life. I took the time to give him a, but I, I love seeing you guys with the enthusiasm that you have for this game. Uh, I wish we could clone you each three, 3000 times. Uh, well. Cause we need, we, we need folks like you uh, to replace uh, not right away. Uh, but to replace uh, those of us who are, uh, you know, at least on the backstretch, if not the five turns. So really, really appreciate it and love what you guys do and love seeing you. Hope to see at least a few of you at Keeneland. And I know between Keeneland and Saratoga and Delmar, I'm sure we'll see all of you in person. Absolutely. Well, I know I know three of us are going for sure. I know Patrick booked his flights, so he'll be there. I'm driving down. I'll be there. Noah goes to school five minutes from Keeneland, which is just an underrated um, underrated luxury nowadays. And I don't know, maybe Charlie will end up making the drive down. We'll see what happens if we can convince him otherwise. But yeah, Paul, like I said, thanks again. Of course, thank your, you guys. Your, um, your picks and wisdom is always appreciated around here. And thank you guys, everyone, for watching. It's been an absolutely great show. We've had over 200 live viewers this entire time. It's been absolutely fantastic. Cannot thank you guys enough because, of course, if there were no viewers, there would be no HHH Racing Podcast. So thank you guys, everyone, for watching. It's been a fantastic time. But for my co-hosts, Paul Halloran, Patrick Kunsel, Charlie Freeman, and Noah Maher, this has been your host, Kyle Roscoe, in episode number 69 of Betting and Boozing here on the HHH Racing Podcast, covering the Florida Derby All Stakes Late Pick 5. And until next time, everybody, crush your bets, win your photos, and stay safe, everyone. We'll see you in the next one. Have a good night.